and th thanks everyone for coming. It's I, I, this I like this venue. You know, we and I, I recognize at least one of the names uh, on there. One of one of our closer colleagues here, but you know, I think that this this venue really allows for a kind of trans Canadian real time that you normally wouldn't be able to do. So uh, I think that this is one of the things that we'll find from the pandemic that actually strengthens some of the things that we do, uh, allowing us to connect more. And it's better than just, you know, you can go onto YouTube right now and you can watch a bunch of videos we've done over the years. And it's not the same as actually kind of hearing it live and then having the ability to interact. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm a radiation oncologist at Sunnybrook in, in Toronto. Um, and I've been here now for about 12 years. Uh, I've been running the active surveillance program since then. A lot of the data that you will see today is obviously uh, accumulation of, of data over many years. So I don't pretend that I'm the one that made this all up. I just happen to have the fortuitous uh, timing of coming in with a very a vibrant program and then being able to kind of lead it going forward. Um, you know, some of the other things that I'm interested in are the genetics of prostate cancer uh, and a bunch of the fancy toys that we use in, with radiation oncology, which I'm happy to discuss afterwards, but obviously this talk will be uh, more centered on um, active surveillance uh, because uh, some of you may know active surveillance started at Sunnybrook. Uh, it was one of the first centers that ever proposed it. It was a crazy idea uh, that people thought that you would watch prostate cancer and in fact, the three docs that started it, uh, Lawrence Klotz, who's still here, uh, Cyril Danju, who's a radiation oncologist who has since retired, and then Richard Chu, who's also a radiation oncologist that went down to the Mayo, they, they decided to open a program for men to watch their prostate cancer, uh, and they were considered to be heretics at the time. Uh, and in fact, it's been shown with multiple other studies around the world that this is the standard of care for early prostate cancer. So, so I think we all owe a, a great debt of, of gratitude to them and all the other uh, groups that have done this. Most of the data that you'll see today is centered around our group because, of course, we're the, ours is the best uh, uh, and the oldest. Um, but, but I'll acknowledge when there's kind of controversy because just because we see something in one cohort of men doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same uh, in others. Uh, and although I'm used to being in front of a live audience and can kind of gauge things, uh, you know, I recognize it's, it's challenging to have people ask questions you know, when it's a video link. So, you know, if you think of something in, in particular in regards to something I'm talking about it, write it down because you, you think you're going to remember it in, in 45 minutes or so, but you aren't going to. So write it down so that we can address it just in case I wasn't clear about something. So what do we do now? Um, reshare your screen, please. <laughs> I gotta share it again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Perfect. Good. Okay. So um, so what I wanted to kind of talk about today was, you know, a little bit of the evolution of why. Uh, why we recommend active surveillance in who or who shouldn't we be doing it with and then how we do it and, and how we don't do it. Because I think that um, what we found is, is that uh, there was this resistance for surveillance, that people thought it was crazy. And then there was this realization that, hey, maybe it's, it's an okay thing. And then I think in some places it swung the other way where there's maybe too much surveillance. So I think there's this ebb and flow of, of these types of programs. And I'll go through some of our data to explain where, where places maybe we have overstepped it in the, in the kind of the cautionary tales uh, of surveillance in, in everybody. So I always like to start off with a little bit about the basics of prostate cancer uh, and the basics of staging, because you know, I know that people are immersed in information and online, uh, but sometimes you gotta step back a bit uh, and kind of understand what it okay. is. Okay, excuse me. Um, you've got... Uh... Your slide, your views switched. So will you please go to display settings and switch the displays? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, thanks. It's on the wrong display. Yeah. So just oh, you're seeing my next upper slide. Left. Upper left. Ooh. Upper left. The display setting button. There you go. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Switch. Yeah. Now you can. Now you don't get a cheap. You can't look at my next slide. Now we don't get to see the next slide. I was very comfortable <laughs> looking at the next slide, thinking, okay, I want to know what the next slide is, but then I realized that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Back to it, but. They'll steal, they'll steal some of my jokes if I do that. Thank you for pointing that out. So, so I mean, the prostate itself, uh, I think everyone knows is a gland. 
that's down in our in our pelvis, at least our, in the male's pelvis. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a gland that sits in between the bladder and the rectum. That's why you know we use a finger to go up and examine it. Uh, it's what we call a tubular alveolar gland, so it secretes things. Uh, in general, it secretes uh, PSA and fluid in PSA, which helps to uh, liquefy uh, the ejaculate so that it can swim freely in uh, the, the vaginal tract. So it's a, it's a very important gland, maybe not as glamorous as like hearts and lungs and things like that, um, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's obviously integral to, to reproduction. Uh, and then you know, people always ask about what, what's cancer because I think that there's a lot of confusion. So, you know, cancer is, is just when your cells uh, become abnormal and they no longer are able to stop growing. So normally when cells get together and they're growing, they will touch each other and stop growing. So that's called contact inhibition. So if you put cells like we see depicted on here in a, in a, in a, in a plate, in a Petri dish, they will normally grow and then they'll stop growing once they touch their buddies. Cancer, a very simplistic way of thinking of it, have lost the ability to stop growing and they'll just keep building up and growing. So, so that's where they just keep dividing and growing. So a, a cancer cell, if it's local, will just continue to cause local damage. And what happens over time is cells then gain the ability to grow outside of their neighborhood. They typically will grow where they can. So for example, with prostate, it's a prostate cell. It's not a different cell, it is a prostate cell. And it will keep growing inside the gland, but eventually will acquire some type of advantage that it now learns how to grow outside of that area. And that's why you know, people worry about biopsies, uh, uh, spreading cancer and all this stuff. It doesn't happen with this type of disease. You could take a lump of the prostate cancer out of your prostate, embed it into your arm, and you would, it would never grow because it doesn't have that ability to do that. So cancers are something that, you know, slowly gain these abilities. Thankfully, with prostate cancer, it is a very slow process in most men. And that's the concept of surveillance is you can find this disease early because we have PSA testing, because we have screening, uh, and, and you can deal with it early or watch it until it turns into something that you think is more concerning. And that's the thing, prostate cancer is prostate cells. You know, not to be too anthropomorphic, but they don't know that they're cancer. They just, they're just little PSA engines. Make PSA, make PSA, that's all they do. Uh, and, and in most cases, that's why PSA testing is so important, is that the more PSA somebody has in their blood is usually indicative to the more prostate cells that they have. So the higher the value, either the higher, the bigger the prostate itself, or there's a prostate cancer because there'll be more cells than you would expect. And what causes the cancer? That's kind of uh, a, a whole other top on its own. Uh, you know, we always consider these things, these, these things to be multifactorial, so it's not one thing, it's not stress, it wasn't, you know, whatever, it ends up being multiple things, but they all tend to be, you know, mistakes happen in the cell, predominantly in our genetic material, uh, that either allow them to forget to stop growing or to gain the ability to grow outside, and these are all stepwise things that happen and with prostate cancer, it in general happens over many years. And, and again, in the, in the context of surveillance, we hope that we can find the disease at a point in time. Everybody that gets diagnosed with prostate cancer, there is a window of time with which they're curable. At some point along that window, they no longer are curable. But the thought is with prostate cancer, the vast majority of guys are caught very early and you can watch safely along the way until they reach a point where you think people need to be treated. And that's some of the stuff that I'll go into. And the other thing is staging. You know, I think that we get bombarded with staging when it comes to information. What stage am I? Am I stage two? Am I stage three? Different cancers have different ways to stage. Prostate cancer doesn't use that type of staging. We generally use risk categories. So low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And what that involves, one is the T stage. So the T stage is what we can, the clinical T stage is the tumor stage. How big is the tumor based on our clinical exam? The issue with this, I think, over time has historically been um, less and less digital rectal examinations being done on the screening level. We see that with um, some movements with 
uh, family physicians suggesting we don't do this test anymore. Uh, it's a bit controversial. Um, the issue is that, you know, most men don't want to have it done either. So, you know, if you go into your family doctor or your urologist and, and someone, do you want to do a finger exam? Most guys are like, yeah, I think I'll pass till next year. Uh, so that kind of goes in the way. So men either hide or they run away. And by running away, I mean more, some men just avoid being seen because they don't like the idea of that exam. And it may not just be the exam, it may just be the whole concept of, you know, looking for a disease that they may have. And that's just human nature. People don't go to the doctor to get their blood pressure checked because they don't want to be diagnosed with high blood pressure. It's crazy, you either have it or you don't. I mean, you should just find out so they can be dealt with. But T-stage is not just the finger exam. So T-stage, when we, when we think about it from a treatment point of view, is also uh, what we see on imaging. And that's something that I think people need to know is that I can do an examination on someone and feel nothing. And this is an example of a patient of mine that that was the case. And his PSA was a little higher than expected based on what things showed. And when we did an MRI, so this is an MRI. So you, the, when we look at MRIs, it's like you were cut through the body and then we're looking up the body from the foot of the bed. This is a close-up. So this is this uh, man's prostate. This is the rectum. These are the bone. This is the hip bones. This is the pubis, those bones at the front. And what we see here in this prostate is that, you, know, you can take, take my word for it, this black fuzzy stuff is tumor. And as you see, when you go up different slices up the scan, it's invading these glands. So this gland right here is called the seminal vesicle. It's the two rabbit ears that sit above the prostate gland. This is a normal seminal vesicle. It's like a lo lobule kind of filled with juice and jelly. Whereas this side here, it's been obliterated by this black fuzzy mass. So this is a very advanced prostate cancer, uh, but it's still what we consider to be a clinical stage. So this is someone that would not be eligible for surveillance and the importance of doing imaging and staging people's now, unlike 20 years ago when you couldn't get all these scans done. So the T stage in essence is, is the vast majority of guys that go on surveillance what we call T1. That means that we couldn't feel it. And then these guys in general are almost all picked up because they had a high PSA. So we did a finger exam, you couldn't feel it, there was a high PSA, it led to a biopsy, the biopsy found a cancer. So that's what we call T1. T1C to be specific, because the T1Bs are when it gets picked up by accident on a TERP procedure, so a local procedure to help urination. T2, which could still go on active surveillance, is something you can feel. So it's a, it's a tumor in uh, the, the prostate that the finger can feel or on an image like an MRI or an ultrasound, you can see that it's contained within the gland itself. So that's T2. T3 is when we start to see it go up into those seminal vesicles or there's evidence that it may be outside of the gland when we feel it and as depicted by this cartoon. So these are the type of tumors that we would not want to put on surveillance unless there was a reason someone couldn't be treated. T4, thankfully, is something we very rarely see these days. That's disease that's pushing out the side of the prostate, getting into the muscles of the pelvic floor, which is just like a bowl, or into the rectum or up into the bladder. This largely now is only we see when uh, men are unfortunately have failed treatments and it's progressed beyond what we normally see, or in men that have never had a PSA test or have never had a digital rectal examination, because this is, would be very easy to feel on, on an exam. And the second part that we look for staging is the Gleason score, and that's a bit of an antiquated term as we're switching, but I'll kind of explain it, because most people know or have heard of their Gleason score. So Gleason is just a really prolific pathologist many years ago that coined a, a, a grading score for prostate. And what it means is that the Gleason score is the combination of the two most common patterns that the, the, the pathologist sees under the microscope out of five. So Gleason one and Gleason two look like prostate. So they're not cancer. Once you get into Gleason three, that just means that the cells are starting to look more abnormal. The gland isn't making the normal gland structures and that's what we start to call early prostate cancer. Whereas you get to Gleason 4 and Gleason 5, that becomes very erratic. So for example, this is completely normal prostate. You see these little round circles, those are the glands. As you get into Gleason 4, it gets a bit more erratic. It's not looking normal. Gleason 5 is just sheets of cells. So this is a very high grade cancer. The pathologist will look at the two most common patterns and give us a score. 
So for the majority of men on active surveillance, all of their disease is Gleason 3. So they have a Gleason 6, so 3 plus 3. Once you start getting elements of pattern four, then we start going into a higher risk disease and it may not be uh, good for surveillance. This has all been slowly switched over to a new grading system to make it a bit more understandable. And then we, we call grade groups. So some of you that may have been diagnosed earlier uh, or, or now, uh, or kind of had things converted, we're now going with grade groups because it's a much simpler way of kind of talking about how much four you have and how much five. So in essence, grade group one is guys with Gleason 6 disease. Uh, and and that's, the low, that's the guy that's a very good candidate for surveillance. Um, and there's really no controversy with that. Once you get up into the higher grade groups, there becomes more elements of pattern four. And the big, big change here is once you get up into grade group four and five, these are the very high risk prostate cancers because they have some element of pattern five disease. So most men on active surveillance will be this grade group one, which is the majority of men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the modern era, because the majority of men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer are diagnosed because their PSA was up, not because there was anything that was felt or any other concerning changes. So if you look at the grade groups, so low grade means you have nothing that you can feel or a very small lump in the, in the prostate. You have Gleason 6 or grade group one, and the PSA is less than 10. So once men's PSA go above 10, then we consider that to be a higher risk category. But I'll talk about some of the nuances of that with surveillance. Intermediate risk prostate cancer is a huge group of guys that have nodules that can be felt. They don't have to, but that's one of the criteria. They have, it could have Gleason 7 disease, and that could be guys with a, almost all of that pattern 3 and a little bit of 4, or vice versa. And PSA is at range between 10 and 20. So those are all categories that, which may make you intermediate. High-risk prostate cancer, guys have any one of these. So a, a large tumor that can be felt, or a Gleason score of eight to 10, or grade group four or five, and a PSA of greater than 20. Any one of those makes a man a high-risk prostate cancer, and we definitely would not recommend surveillance. So this is the group we're really talking about for surveillance, low-risk disease. There's different, there's different categories of, of doing it depending on who you read, but this is the most common thing uh, that is used you know, across most of the studies. So small tumors, grade group one disease with a PSA of less than 10. So the question is why? Like why, why do we do surveillance? Um, and why is it something that should be recommended and the data behind that? And, wh and why, why is there election going on soon that is crazy, uh, crazy uh, candidates? So I think there's lots of studies that show, and I'm not gonna go back into the old PSA measurements and why we did PSAs and is PSA good and bad. We're just gonna assume for, the, for the, the basics of this talk that PSA testing is important and it should be done. Uh, and what we, what we recognize is that we will find wide ranges of diseases, including very early prostate cancer that probably don't need to be treated. So this is a very a big, relatively uh, uh, important landmark study. It was called the PIVOT trial. And it was a very ambitious trial and tried to get men that were diagnosed with, with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And then they were randomized to either having surgery or what they called observation. So not necessarily surveillance, but not treated. So as you'll see, 13,000 men were entered. 5,000 of those guys were found to be eligible. So they met all the criteria. Only 730 decided to be randomized. So there's a huge group of guys that were like, you're crazy, I'm not, I'm not letting you decide. And that's probably because this included very low risk prostate cancers, it also included higher risk cancers. So a lot of these guys decided not to treat it, but there were 730 men that decided that they would go ahead and be randomized to either treatment, which was mostly surgery, or observation. And the important thing about this study is if you look at these patients, the red group being the observation group and the blue group being the surgery group, if you look at survival, there was a 5% difference at 15 years in regards to the group. So the guys that were randomized to observation were 5% more likely to die of anything. It's not necessarily prostate cancer. And that, those curves, they separated quite early. So even at five years, there was a difference between observation and treatment. So that would suggest that we should just be treating everybody. But this was all comers. If you took out the guys that just had low risk disease and you compared the treatment arm versus the observation arm, there was no difference. If anything, the curves look like the observation is a little bit better because going up here is bad. This is, means you're dying. 
So a higher chance of dying. But if you look at those guys 15, 15 years later, there's really no statistical difference. So with the low risk men, whether they were put on observation or a having surgery, it didn't make a difference. Suggestive that you should, these guys should be not be treated and be observed. But the issue is that that trial was um, observation. That wasn't or what, what we sometimes term as watchful waiting. And watchful waiting is not the same as active surveillance. So, so this is watchful waiting the way we view it is, is you're just, you're doing nothing. You're waiting till a problem's gonna happen and then maybe you'll wake up, maybe you'll do something about it. So, you know, it's not very active at all. You're essentially waiting till there's a big problem, like a local problem with urination or problems in the bones. But we look at active surveillance as, you know, monitoring very closely, keeping an eye on everything. And then eventually, you know, you bring in the soldiers to, 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 to fix the, uh, the, the, the problem. So there's a, there is a big difference. And watch waiting is something we still do uh, for men that we think, um, aren't suitable for treatment or are old enough that, you know, those guys, the weighing of the risks and benefits of treatment versus observation are worth it. But doctors are notoriously wrong for predicting how long people are going to live. And we all have people in our practice that were told, oh, you're 86, don't worry, you're going to die of something else. And then four years later, they have widespread metastatic disease because no one took them seriously. So we really think that, you know, watch waiting is for a very small proportion of, of men. So, so active surveillance isn't watch waiting. Uh, there is somewhat intense monitoring and that can, that is uh, thankfully invasiveness of that monitoring is slowly decreasing, which I'll discuss. In essence, what it is, is, is we're expecting to be able to delay successful treatment for patients, for people until they develop some type of progression that makes us think that things have changed. And, and what we don't call that kind of progressing, we call that reclassification. You have a low risk disease, something changes, we're gonna reclassify you into a higher risk, and treat you then. You're just as curable then as you were here, as long as we mo monitor you closely. For older men, this is quite frankly to avoid treatment because the men are more likely to die of other causes. In our database, if you look at men that are over 70 years old, they're like 20 something more times likely to die of something else other than prostate cancer. So watching them is very safe. That said, it doesn't mean a man that's 75 can't die of prostate cancer, you don't watch it. So we don't put them on watch or waiting, we stay on surveillance, and if something changes, do the treatment at that point. For younger men, it's to delay treatment. So, and that's because if I had a magic ball and someone that was 55 is diagnosed with low risk disease, and I know we can wait another five or 10 years until we treat them, and they'll be just as cured, it's wait five or 10 years. Uh, because quality of life impact would be less. Uh, you have another 10 years, perhaps, of, of no side effects of therapy. And the treatments change so significantly with prostate cancer. For example, the guys that I'm treating now with radiotherapy that have been on surveillance for the last 15 years, the treatment they're getting is so much better than what they would have gotten 15 years ago, uh, that they got the benefit of all that technology and change. It can, it can make people have less options. So if I see a man right now at 70 years old that really wants to have a radical prostatectomy, but he decides to go on surveillance, and then he reclassifies at 76, he may not be a good candidate for surgery anymore. It doesn't mean he's going to die of his disease. It just means that if he really wanted surgery, it may not be an option because at 76, the risks may be too high. So there are some caveats to that. But for younger men, essentially, we want to delay treatment. So we are, uh, I was very hoping when, when, when Dr. Cox had invited me to do this talk that I would be able to present to you some of our new data because we are currently updating all of our data, but it's not ready. Um, we had to get our database cleaned up. Um, so most of the data that I'm going to discuss with the global is about five years old. We do have some newer data, newer data which I'll discuss regarding uh, high risk, higher risk disease on surveillance as well as compliance issues. Um, but we expect to have an update of our, of our entire database later this year. So probably it will be published uh, next year. But I mean, just in a nutshell, as I said, surveillance started at Sunnybrook in 1995. In essence, it was a, a, a group of guys that, that if you didn't want to have treatment, they would put them on surveillance. Uh, had to have prostate cancer, couldn't have been treated before, of course. In regards to the, the T stage, it was okay if we felt a bump, but it couldn't be aggressive. It couldn't be up into the seminal vesicles because that would be something that wrong to offer um, following. Uh, so the majority of men were Gleason 6, so grade group one disease. For men that were greater than 70 that, that had some medical issues, they, they did allow 
guys with Gleason 7, but mostly pattern 3, so that's grade group 2. And most men had to have a PSA of less than 10, uh, but again, it was allowed to be a little higher if men were older. And this is the initial cohort. Uh, but to be honest with you, that was really only the first 450 men. Uh, afterwards, it was kind of just an open up for everybody. Anybody that was interested in surveillance was allowed to go on our open protocol. It's not a trial. It's not a randomized study. It's a cohort of men that decided that they want to go on surveillance and entered into our program. So the last time we updated this was about five years ago. Uh, uh, and um, in mo a lot of the data will be involved with that. About 75% of our men are true low risk disease. So early disease on the finger, a Gleason score of six grade group one and PSAs of less than 10. But there are 25% of the guys that don't meet those criteria and which is important because I'll present some of that data. So how do we do it? So in general, you'll, you'll see a bunch of different uh, protocols and how to do surveillance. Every center has its own magic. We all think we're doing the right thing. You know, I tell all the residents that train with me, don't worry about what you do. Have something that makes sense and stick with it. And that's kind of what we've done. So we do PSA blood tests every three months for the first two years. That gives us a good sense of what the PSA is doing. And then every six months afterwards, when guys get older and they're at the point where maybe in their 80s and, and treatment's not going to necessarily uh, uh, be offered, we start to do it on a yearly basis. We do do repeat biopsies still. So the, we, ha, we, we do what's called a confirmatory biopsy. So a biopsy that's done within 12 months of the, of the first diagnosis biopsy. And that's to double check, to make sure we didn't miss something the first time. Because in our older data, about 15 to 20% of men, when you repeat the biopsy, they actually have a higher grade cancer that was just missed with the needles the first time. Then we consider repeat biopsying every three years until the age of about 75 or 80. And that's to check to see if the cancer is now changing. Is it going from Gleason 6 to Gleason 7? Because if that's the case, then we might want to do something about it. This is slowly evolving because we're increasing the use of MRIs to guide the biopsy and maybe decide who does and doesn't need biopsies. That's a whole different talk on its own, uh, but a lot of the data that we have here is jaded with the fact that we don't do as many biopsies now as we did before, because the MRI is slowly making us un avoid unnecessary biopsies. And we do a digital record examination every six to 12 months. Essentially every time a guy comes in, unless he tells me no. So why would we retreat people? So when, when people reclassify, we recommend treatment if we think if their life expectancy is long enough. So PSA doubling time. So we have all these algorithms. If it looks like the PSA is going to double within three years, we recommend treatment. Back when it first started, they used two years, but that was way too stringent. And very few guys had doubling times less than two years. So it's now three years. That's largely gone because in general, PSA changing is prompting us to do MRI sooner. So we don't have many guys that need to be treated because the PSA is going up quicker because we find them before it's a, a problem. Uh, the most common one now is upgrading of the Gleason score on repeat biopsy or the grade group. So you had Gleason 6 to start off. We repeat the biopsy. It's now Gleason 7, grade group 2. We recommend treatment. Or if someone came to us with two of their needles, had prostate cancer, and we repeat the biopsy, and now there's 10, I would say, you know what, this is growing quicker than we said, even if it's still low grade, probably should recommend treatment. Very rare, but every once in a while someone didn't have a nodule on the finger and now they do, and that would be a recommend, we'd recommend treatment. And there's others that you, we see scattering of. A lot, some guys now are having changes on MRI, which are concerning enough that they decide just to go ahead with treatment and not have another biopsy. Some guys decide to go off and have something done because their urinary function is so bad, they just want to get rid of the prostate. So you kind of t kill two birds with one stone. Either have a TERP procedure, but that you would, you would stay on surveillance or have the prostate removed. And although it's decreasing in, in, in frequency, every once in a while guys come in, they just say, I'm done with this, just treat me. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to stay on surveillance, usually because of maybe some of their family had prostate cancer or some other psychological reason. So with our cohort, so we have about 14, uh, I think it's 1,409 men last time I looked uh, on our surveillance program. Um, it has slowed down because of COVID. There's no doubt about it. And that's because a lot of men aren't having PSA tests and they're not having their biopsies. Uh, so we do expect that kind of to trend back up. We have about 600 that we actively follow that are still on surveillance. 
uh, and about 550 men that ultimately have been treated. A lot of men have died of other reasons. Uh, we've had men that got lost to follow up because they got old, they didn't want to come in anymore or they moved. So there's, there's always holes in data with these types of cohorts because you can't keep track of everybody, but we try as much as we can. The average age of when people enroll in the program is, is about 67 or 68 years old, I think, which is a pretty common age for prostate cancer. Anyways, uh, we've put a couple of guys in their early 40s on the program with a little bit of trepidation. Uh, and the oldest, at least to date, is about 89 years old. A man that was diagnosed with low-risk prostate cancer at 89. I don't know why he was diagnosed with prostate cancer at age. It seems a bit old to be doing it, but, uh, but d definitely the kind of person you don't want to have to treat. We have about 350 patients that have been followed more than 10 years. I think that's actually higher because this is older data. And we have over 60 men now that have been followed more than 20 years on surveillance. So this is the oldest cohort that we know of uh, in the world in regards to following them. So the question is, how likely is someone to be treated if they're on surveillance? And this is our data, acknowledging that, again, every different big court, there's a big one in Baltimore, there's a big one uh, down in UCLA, so bigger groups have it. But we find that about a quarter of the men are, uh, need to be treated within five years. Uh, and, and about a third are treated at 10 years. This is changing a little bit, mainly because of the use of MRI and the fact that We've become way more comfortable with surveillance. So I think a lot of the men that were treated early in the program were treated because the PSA went up a little bit and people kind of said, well, I don't know what to do, let's just treat. Um, so I think that there's a little bit less of that, but it, it's probably um, countered by the fact that we're doing MRIs in men that have nor PSAs that have been completely under control and we find something on the MRI, we stick a needle in it and it ends up being a little bit of grade group two disease, Gleason seven, and we treat those guys. Whereas those men may have never had a change and if we didn't have the MRI, we never would have known. So that's some of the data that we're looking at with our newer analysis, because I suspect that we may be treating roughly the same amount, but we're treating different people than we did before. So the reasons for being treated, so the top three triggers still in our database, having a short doubling time. So the PSA looks like it's doubling within three years. Thankfully that is going down. Um, mainly because of MRI. And the reason that that's a good thing is that if you, in a, if not in the context of this study, if, or this talk, if you look at the men that were treated, the ones that do the worst are the people that we treated because the PSA was going up quickly. So it means that we're catching those guys too late. So if you're waiting till a PSA goes up, not for all of them, but it's too late compared to grade progression, if this, which is the second most common. So if, if we treated a man based on the fact that his repeat biopsy showed Gleason 7 or higher disease, that guy's more likely to be cured than the guy that his PSA was going up. Most of these are pre-MRI. So most of the guys in this group of men, 116 guys, at least at that data point, that were treated for prostate cancer because their PSA dubbing time was short, did not have MRIs. And that's why I think that these numbers will be a lot different as time goes on. The third most common reason has, was patient preference. But again, that's going to change uh, almost certainly. The numbers are small, and we have way more guys now that are being treated because of MRI changes, which we consider to be uh, stage progression, so it looks worse on the MRI. So patient preference is not very common anymore, and that's because both, I think, people are more comfortable with surveillance and doctors are more comfortable with surveillance. There certainly are a group of people that were treated here because the doctor got worried not because the patient was. Um, and, and so thankfully that's, a, I think, an acceptance. And then if you look at how we do with our entire cohort, if you look at all the men that we follow, if you, if you are diagnosed today with low risk, predominantly prostate cancer, and you're put on surveillance, the likelihood that your PSA will be under control, meaning either you didn't go up enough that we needed to treat you, or you were treated and it was under control, at five years is about 94%, and at 10 years is about 85%. So those are pretty good numbers, and as you'd expect, even if someone was treated, if you treated everybody. But if you look at, and the reason why we can do better is if you look at the people that were treated. So this is not the entire cohort of men. These are the men that needed to be treated for whatever reason. And how did they do after they got treated? So 25% of those men, if they're treated, will end up failing in that their PSA starts to go up again. And so that, so that means we're probably picking up these guys a little later than we should. 
Not that it means it's gonna translate into death, but if you knew you need to be treated, you wanna be treated with the highest chance of success so that you don't need another treatment down the road. And if you look at those numbers, the five and 10 year failure rate at five years, about 80, 20% have failed. So 80% are still alive with their PSA under control. If you look at those guys at 10 years, it's about 60%. So that's down here as this curve goes down as time goes on. So that tells us that we can do a better job of identifying men that need to be treated. Again, acknowledging the reason we have 16 and now 20 year data is that these guys were all diagnosed back in the 90s. So it's not the same as it is now, but that's the best data that we have. And the other thing is this is just to dispel the myth about the difference between radiation and surgery. If you compare the guys on surveillance that needed to be treated, some guys chose surgery, some guys chose radiation. There's no difference. Whether a man chose surgery or radiation, it doesn't make any difference. These curves bounce back and forth because it doesn't make a difference in regards to the local therapy. More men chose radiation, mainly because you're talking about an older group of people uh, and they're probably just not as good surgical candidates. You're also talking about what we call selection bias. A lot of the initial guys that went into active surveillance were guys that were just very adverse to treatment. So when they needed to be treated, they, they ran away from the surgery option, as well as some guys were picked up too late and we thought that they were higher risk. And radiation plus or minus hormone therapy is really the standard treatment for higher risk prostate cancers. Surgery is better for lower risk disease. But there is no difference, at least in our, in our, in our uh, experience. What about death? And this is the difference with our active surveillance program compared to some of the other ones in the world. We actually have had men that have died of prostate cancer that went on surveillance. And this is a curve of men that die. As this, this is the probability of being alive because of prostate cancer. So if, if someone in this, you see these little check marks along all these little lines, those are guys that are no longer alive, but they didn't die of prostate cancer. They died of something else. That's what we call it censored. Whereas when a man dies of prostate cancer, this line goes down. And what we found is that we've, to date, and I think there might be a couple more, uh, uh, just based on a recent analysis, so we've had 25 of our, our 1,400 men die of prostate cancer. 46 men develop metastatic disease, which to me is just as, no, it's not just as bad as dying, but it is a, it's a failure of surveillance because you should never get to a point where you have metastatic disease. So that puts us at about a 1.8% risk of dying of prostate cancer and a 3.3% risk um, of, of, of metastatic disease. If you look at all the actual curves. So it's not zero, uh, but that would be the same as we would quote someone if they had upfront treatment. If I see a man with Gleason 7 disease, so grade group two, that's gonna have radiation or surgery, not go on surveillance, the odds of dying of prostate cancer in 10 to 15 years is about 1%. So it's no different for, with all the men that we put on our surveillance program. Again, it doesn't mean we can't do better. Just like it doesn't, we can do better if the guys that's gonna be treated up front to identify who should and shouldn't be treated. The other caveat to this data is that this is all the men in our program. So re remember I said 25% of our guys did not have low risk disease. And that's actually what drives a lot of these deaths, which I'll get to. So the next is who. Who should be going on surveillance, right? Because you have, there's a, it's a huge controversy uh, around the world right now, and where I think surveillance has been maybe overdone uh, in some scenarios, where a lot of guys are with intermediate risk disease are being offered surveillance, where maybe the data is not so clear. And I don't know if anyone here is a Doctor Who fan, but that's the new Doctor Who, which caused much controversy in the world because she's a woman. And how could a woman be Doctor Who? Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't get any trouble from the PC police here. So the question that what I want to talk about is more like who not. So, so why in our cohort are we seeing men that go on surveillance that you think you're watching go on to develop metastatic disease? Because this is the scenario that we want. We want to be able to pick out a group of guys and pick out the one or two guys that, that, that you think uh, shouldn't be on. The problem is, is that, you know, we sometimes really think we know what we're looking at. But, you know, sometimes it just isn't that easy. You know, like you can study things and you really think you know what you're dealing with, uh, but ultimately you, d you don't have the right, uh, right answer. And that's kind of what we've seen. And that's some of the research, for example, that Dr. Cox is involved with, that we're involved with. Try to find these biomarkers of, of who is and isn't suitable for, for one treatment or the other. So it's a very busy, uh, uh, big uh, table, but I just want to point out that 
you know, we, we did have um, 24 to 25% of our men had what we call intermediate prostate cancer in our, in our larger cohort. Uh, and and rem rem remember, intermediate disease can mean either having Gleason 7 or having a PSA of 10 to 20. The reason that's an important distinction is that there's a lot of guys with a PSA that's over 10 that we call intermediate prostate cancer. But it's because they have a huge honker of a gland. And that's why they got into this mess in the first place. Their PSA was 12, not because they had prostate cancer, but because they're, they got a hundred, they got a prostate the size of a grapefruit. And the PSA of 12 is actually normal for that. So, so the, the issue is, is that we do have a, a good cohort of men that went on surveillance that actually had Gleason 7 disease. So the type that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be putting on surveillance. So what we did is a study that we published several years ago we only looked at the guys in our cohort that had intermediate risk prostate cancer. Throw out the guys with low risk disease because we know it's safe for them, but just watch the intermediate risk disease. And then we compared what are the odds that someone's going to remain, be in surveillance and be, be, be alive and well 5, 10, 15 years later compared to those that end up having metastatic disease, so having a disease spread, comparing the, the true low risk disease, the guys with Gleason 6, to those with intermediate risk. And at least in our data, what we found is that if you look at all the men with intermediate risk, so either having Gleason 7 or a PSA of 10 to 9, you look at those guys at 15 years, there's about a 17% chance, so 83% that they're still alive without metastasis. So I mean, 17% chance that they've developed metastatic disease, whereas with the lower risk, it was only 5%. And there's a reason for that, which I'll get to a bit later. So there's a significant difference between those with low risk disease and intermediate risk. What's important is that if you compare the groups of that we consider intermediate risk, so intermediate risk is either PSA is 10 to 20 or Gleason 7. And if you look at those, what we found is if your PSA was greater than 10, it wasn't much different than you would expect for a low risk disease because the majority of our guys with a PSA of greater than 10 Again, their PSA is not high because of prostate cancer. But if you looked at the guys that had Gleason 7 as their criteria for intermediate disease, there was a 30% chance they developed metastatic disease within 15 years. And this is why, with all the caveats to our data, these are guys that may not have been compliant, they may have not wanted treatment. So that's all, you can't figure that out with this data. All we know is you just, guys were diagnosed and what happened to them 15 years later? But that's why we are still very cautious about putting men with intermediate risk prostate cancer on surveillance. And then we looked at all of our groups because we also have guys with even higher risk disease than that. And, and this is a bit of a busy uh, figure. But what we see is that if you had a Gleason score of six and a PSA of less than 10, which is the very high bar, or PSA of 10 to 20 with Gleason six, they're all up here. There's really no difference. So as long as you have Gleason six disease, you do okay. If you had a Gleason 7, but grade group 2, so mostly 3 and a little bit of 4, that's where you start to get close to 20% of men developing metastatic disease. And we do, we do have a cohort of men that had what we call grade group 3 or Gleason 7 with, with predominant pattern 4. They have about a 40% chance of having metastatic. These guys should never be considered for surveillance. And that's where we're seeing things out in the community kind of getting a little bit loosey-goosey Whereas there's evidence that if you, if you go on surveillance outside of a big academic center, you don't do as well. Part of it, I think, is they don't have the radiologist and the pathologist, but part of it is that I think a man that is seen out in the community that maybe is 75 with medical issues that has this disease <laughs> said, well, we can put you on surveillance. But in fact, that get, man shouldn't go on surveillance because even if you look at these guys at five years, some of them are de developing metastatic disease sooner than you would expect. So in part, in that part, you know, we have the largest series of guys with intermediate disease put on surveillance, probably because we have been very liberal with letting people into our program. Whereas some of the bigger programs, for example, in the, in the, in the States would never let those guys go on surveillance. And even if they went on surveillance, they would never put them in their academic programs because they don't think it's right. We think that despite, you know, selecting the guys that we thought were good for surveillance. So for example, you could have Gleason 7, mostly 3, and a little bit of 4. It could be 5% 4, 10% 4, 40% 4. They're all the same. We couldn't find any pattern 4 that was safe. 
So it still looks like in our hands, if men go on surveillance with intermediate disease, they have a higher chance of de developing metastatic disease, despite the fact that a lot of those guys got treated and they were followed, had biopsies, and their, their higher chance of dying of prostate cancer compared to guys with Gleason 6, with all the caveats. Were these guys compliant? Most were done before the use of MRI, so I assume a lot of those guys that had higher grade cancers got missed, wouldn't get missed. So I think this is the worst case scenario. I don't think it's as bad as that in the modern era, but I can't tell people, is the risk 15%, is it 10%, is it 5% chance of having metastatic disease? We don't know. Does explain why we need better biomarkers. And again, not in the context of this study uh, uh, or this talk, I mean. So I have a study uh, uh, going where we're looking at a whole bunch of genes in all of these men to see whether or not we could have predicted who did well and who didn't do well, who was good for surveillance, who wasn't. So hopefully we'll have some type of urine or blood test in the future that'll be able to see a guy with intermediate disease, do that panel and say, okay, you're the kind of guy that was fine on surveillance, so let's watch you. And you're the kind of guy that isn't, you should go ahead treatment right away. And then how not? I mean, this is the whole thing. When, when, you, when you have a, a database and people for over many years, you learn the things that didn't work or, or the things that were perhaps done wrong. Um, so the question is, does it matter how we do surveillance? Reminder, we do the PSA every three to six months. We do the biopsy, the confirmatory biopsy within 12 months. That's to double check. And then every two to three years until age 75 to 50, increasing the use of MRIs. And then, and then DREs, they used to do bone scans, we don't anymore. So it's more about the biopsy. So we, we wondered if part of the reason why guys weren't doing well is that they weren't being compliant with our, our protocol because it wasn't stringent. If a guy said no, we said, okay, it's your life. Uh, we won't do it. So what we did is we decided to, to, to compare how men did in groups of guys that were compliant, so they got the biopsies, versus guys that did not have the biopsies. Uh, and, and if you look in real life databases around the world, compliance with biopsies is pretty poor. So for example, of all the men on surveillance in some of these big databases in the US, only about 65% will go on to have another biopsy. The rest don't. I don't know if that's their fault or whose fault it is. And if you look at the next set of biopsies, only one in five, so 20% will. Our compliance rate is maybe a little bit better than that. Uh, I don't know if it's just kind of the Canadian way. Uh, about almost, you know, three quarters of our guys will have that confirmatory, that first biopsy within a year. About half will have the next one. And close, it tends to be, because the guy that has the, the third one is probably going to have the fourth one too. So our, our data was a, is a little bit better than you compare. The issue just is, is that, you know, the more, more biopsies people have, the more likely guys are just to say, stop, I don't want to do it. And I don't blame them because you've had three biopsies, nothing's changed. Why the heck would I do it again? Um, and I think that that's why compliance slowly goes down as time, time goes on. So in our study, we just decided to determine whether or not compliance to the biopsy mattered. Uh, and I think that we, wanted, we compared the men that were compliant with the first biopsy because that's the most important biopsy. That's the one that determines whether or not we missed higher grade cancer compared to men that were not. So were versus were not. And we, we compared the men that end up being treated and had whether they failed their treatment. So their PSA went up despite being treated. We looked at metastatic disease and we looked at the chance of dying of prostate cancer. And we, uh, that's it, that, uh, it's, it's kind of half published. So you, you'll see in the medical literature, they, we, we, we get the paper accepted and then they put it in print first. So it's been sitting online for several months, but it actually won't be published until November. Um, but again, what we compared is, is the men that were non-compliant with biopsies versus those that were compliant. And men, were, men that are, are non-compliant are more likely to be older, which is understandable because they're like, oh, I don't want to have a biopsy. Well, it's not going to change anything. They don't want to take the risk of the biopsy or the doc doesn't want to take, give them the risk of the biopsy. But all the other factors are relatively the same. But what's important is that if you look at the men that were treated for prostate cancer on surveillance, compared to the guys that didn't have a confirmatory biopsy that did, the men that didn't have a confirmatory biopsy were more likely to fail their treatment. So they were picking, pick, picked up later than they should have. So 40% of those guys failed treatment, whereas only 26% that had had the confirmatory biopsy. 
what we're striking is that 13% of the men that were non-compliant developed metastatic disease. So these guys were being picked up too late because they didn't have that confirmatory biopsy, whereas the rate, if you had a biopsy, was, was a lot lower. And again, that translates into a difference in death. If, if any of you have read studies, this p-value, which means the likelihood that what we're seeing is real or not real, uh, usually you want that to be 0 0.05, which is about 5% chance that it's not real, if you want to think of it simplistically. So this is what we call uh, a borderline. We want to make it sound like we, we know what we're talking about. Uh, but the issue just is, is that prostate cancer deaths, even in the setting of having metastatic disease, happen 15, 20 years later. So this is probably just a sign that our data isn't old enough. But it does show that men develop more likely to develop metastatic disease if they didn't have a confirmatory biopsy. And this is just looking at it kind of visually. I think some people, some people like that. The red line are the guys uh, that were compliant, so they did have a biopsy, whereas the black are the ones that didn't. And as you can see, this is the chance of having recurrence after treatment. The men that didn't have a biopsy are more likely to recur, you know, even 15, 20 years later. And if you look at developing metastatic disease, the curve is uh, decreased, uh, going up. So as it goes up, that's the higher chance of developing metastatic disease. The men that weren't compliant with biopsies, even you know, within nine to 10 years, start to increase their chance of, of getting metastatic disease. And again, that translates to dying. The interesting thing about these two tape, uh, uh, graphs is that you know, with metastatic disease, you see the uptick start at about five years. There's guys that start to develop. Every, every single one of these little tick marks is a, a one gentleman that developed metastatic disease. But when you look at death, it's, it, it's delayed. And that's because, thankfully, with prostate cancer, even when men develop metastatic disease, life expectancy is very long. So the guys that are dying of their metastatic disease are dying you know, five, 10 years after they were first diagnosed. And that's why we see this tick up happening much later. So if you look at the guys that only had low risk disease, so all of those men that we talked about compliance, a lot of them had intermediate risk disease. But so we pulled out only the guys with true low risk disease. Gleason 6, a PSA of less than 10. And we found that even in that group, if they didn't have a repeat biopsy, they were more likely to fail their treatment if they were treated, and they're more likely to develop metastatic disease. So this is not just because of Gleason 7 guys not being compliant. A Gleason 6 prostate cancer that doesn't get a repeat biopsy, in our experience, is more likely to develop metastatic disease, albeit 10 to 15 years later. So, so this is the first study that has ever shown that following a regimen actually makes a difference. Uh, and, and what we think is, is that the guys that didn't have that first confirmatory biopsy, there are percentage that there was higher grade disease that was missed. And that miss then translates into a poor outcome 10 years later. And that the, the striking thing is that it, even with Gleason 6 disease, and that's why, you know, and that's again why I think that men in the community with uh, even with low risk disease that go on surveillance, unfortunately don't do as well because they're less compliant with biopsies. And so you could be missing some disease that should be treated or you're missing the progression to the earlier disease that could be cured and you're only finding out later. The caveat to this is all that um, we, most of this data, because it's you know, 10, 15 years old, we weren't using MRIs. So I suspect in the modern era, as long as someone can have an MRI, those guys would have been picked out earlier and treated and we wouldn't see that problem. Uh, and the other issue is, is that the MRI probably will allow us to take the place of the biopsies. So you do an MRI, as long as you see nothing, it's okay, you keep watching, you repeat the MRI instead of a biopsy in two to three years, and as long as nothing's changed, you continue. We don't know for sure, so we still recommend that we, every man has that first biopsy after their diagnosis, so the confirmatory biopsy, regardless of what the MRI shows. The subsequent um, MRIs probably will drive whether or not biopsies should be done. So how are we going to get better? So that's something that many of us uh, across Canada and, and across uh, the world are working on. And, and that's because um, we can do better both at identifying people that can go on surveillance and then when people are on surveillance, who should stay on and who should be treated. And then once you get treated, how should you be treated? 
Maybe surgery is better for one guy. Radiation is better for the other. Maybe HIFU, all these other weird and wonderful things that people are offered these days. So we really want to identify who the true low risk patient is. Um, so using new biomarkers, so markers that biological markers that we use to kind of determine prognosis or treatment, increased use of MRIs and all the, the different ways it can be done, histopathology, so things on pathology that we can look at and change. Uh, what, something that's obviously very important to me is, is, is looking at the blood, uh, urine, and the genetics uh, of men, either the genetics of the man or the genetics of the tumor. Uh, and that's a, a, a big collaborator here at Sunnybrook with me named Stanley Liu uh, has, has a big lab in regards to looking at urine biomarkers in particular. And then there's the surveillance versus minimally invasive treatment. You know, maybe there is, maybe men could have high food to dominant lesions uh, in their prostate. So only treat the area, but then surveil the rest and deal with things as they come. You know, in, in, with, and again, not in the context of this, this presentation, but the radiation that we have now is, is so precise that the side effect profile is really plummeted. And I got in a bit of a heated discussion with one of my colleagues a few years ago at a, at a conference where I was discussing, I think, the Gleason 7 stuff. And he got up and he said, ah, oh, what are you talking about active surveillance? You know, you guys with your SBRT and your fancy radiation, you're going to get to a point where people go, get diagnosed, they go downstairs, they have their single shot of radiation with no side effects. Why would you go on surveillance? And we kind of had a debate. But you know, the truth is that I think there's some, there is some truth to that, that not, it might not be for everybody, but if we could offer someone a treatment that is non-invasive with minimal side effects and, you know, a 95 or greater percent chance that it'll never go, come back, some guys might choose that instead of going on surveillance and having biopsies and maybe getting diagnosed high grade cancer in five years and maybe needing hormones. So there are some, some caveats as technology improves. And prevention. So that's something that we've been interested here at Sunnybrook for some time. It's a very challenging thing to work on. Uh, it's not one of my um, pet projects. It's more with Dr. Klotz, who's kind of the leader here in that. Um, and the issue is, is that you have a group of men, as I've explained to you, with Gleason 6 disease, as long as we put you on surveillance, the likelihood of dying of the disease is less than 1%. So you ain't going to make that much better. But there are a lot of interest in, in, got, in people doing it. And the other thing is just that you know, I understand, particularly uh, men with prostate cancer that are on the internet and reading stuff, and everyone's giving you lots of good advice, is that, you know, a lot of the stuff in regards to supplementation, diet, there, it's, you know, people have good intentions, uh, but it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, the, one of the biggest things that I'm sure some people in this group have heard uh, that we hear a lot of is, is this whole sugar madness, that, sh you know, eating sugar makes your cancer grow. It's, it's, it's completely ridiculous. Um, you know, you're, you can't eat sugar and make a tumor grow. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but that's something that kind of, unfortunately, with social media and that gets propagated. We would like to try to look at things. And I, I think what it would be is not to save any lives, but the hopes is that there would be some supplementation that would decrease the odds that someone needed to be treated. Because uh, that's the issue is we're still treating, um, you know, a third or even more of the men in 10 years. But if we could find something that slowed down the prostate cancer growth or got rid of the background noise that confuses us, that makes us want to treat people, that would be a good supplement. And, and although I'm a, I'm a, a, a well-known skeptic when it comes to all this snake oil, uh, I think that there are, there are opportunities to test it. And it's one of the things that we hope to get off the ground here at Sunnybrook at some point. So in conclusion, you know, active surveillance is safe for low-risk prostate cancers in the intermediate and even long-term our data that will come up soon will be 20 years. I'm not so sure about intermediate disease. I think in the modern era, it's not crazy to consider surveillance. If you have good MRIs, good pathologists, I just think that we don't know what the odds are that it's a mistake. And I think that everyone that goes on surveillance with intermediate disease needs to go with their eyes open, that there's a small chance that five years down the road, there may be a problem. I, I, I suspect that it's not a life or death difference anymore. I suspect what it is, is that if you come to me today with intermediate prostate cancer, your options are surgery, brachytherapy, stereotactic radiation. These are all very good, successful treatments with a small chance of side effects. But if you go on surveillance and five years later, you have Gleason 9 prostate cancer, then your treatment is radiation plus hormone therapy and with a less chance of curing it. You didn't die because of it. 
but you need more therapy with more side effects. So I think that that's probably what it's going to be longer term. So we really say there should be caution, putting any man with Gleason 7 on surveillance, keeping into mind age, life expectancy, a guy comes to you with really bad heart and everything, yeah, go on surveillance, right? I mean, it's not, you don't need to treat everybody. Um, and, and the confirmatory biopsy is still needed. You know, this is our data, we believe in it. We have lots of data that MRI is, is helpful, but until we have great data, MRI can take the place of it, at least that first confirmatory biopsy, we think needs to be done. The other biopsies afterwards, I think most of us are very comfortable, as long as the PSA is under control, to just rely on the MRI, as long as you trust who is interpreting the MRI. There is data that it depends on who's reading it, uh, that you can get very, uh, adverse results if the radiologist doesn't have experience because we rely I can't read those MRIs and I try have to trust them and if all of a sudden they're not reading it right you're making clinical decisions based on that and that's again another reason why men in the community don't tend to do as well because their radiologists in the community don't have the experience to to, follow, to to read these MRIs the way they should to try to pick out what's nothing what's Gleason 6 and what's Gleason 7 or higher in, in all the research that we have going on, in looking at genes, looking at, gen, uh, at blood, urine, pathology, uh, is all ongoing and a huge uh, 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 focus for a lot of us uh, that are in the field. So as I said, this is a very big group. I'm not gonna go through everybody here, um, but, but I'm just the spokesperson for it now. Um, uh, and, uh, but obviously it's, a, it's a, a huge machine with a lot of moving pieces. And that's it for my spiel. I'm happy to take specific questions or I don't know what Rochelle, how she wants to do it. If you guys want a bio break. Um, okay, I've got a whole bunch of questions lined up here for you. So I'll, I'll maybe get started with this first one. Um, is DRE still required at follow-up appointments as part of AS? That's a good question. You know, I think it's, it's still something that we recommend. Um, for two reasons. One is because it's easy. Nobody likes it. We don't like doing it either. Uh, uh, it costs a glove, a little bit of gel and, and a, you know, some dignity. The reason is, is that although it's a relatively rare change, if you feel something on the finger that's not picked up on a PSA test, that's the person who really needs to have it found. Because a, a tumor growing in the absence of a PSA going up is usually a marker of high grade disease. So, you know, I think it's something that very rarely helps, but if the person that it helps really needs it. So it, it, hard pressed to not do it um, in surveillance. I don't tend to do it in guys that I've treated. Guys that I've treated that are well with a low PSA, I mean, unless the guy tells me something uh, that's new, we wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend it. Thank you. Um, when does it become wise to transfer from AS to active treatment? What are the specific markers? So, so at least in our experience, and I think that every, every group does something different, um, in the modern era, it would be any suspicion that your disease has changed from uh, Gleason 6, or if you're on surveillance with early Gleason 7 to a higher grade. So it usually means either an MRI or the finger noticing that that disease is extended outside the gland, again, that's rare, or on a repeat biopsy, the disease is now Gleason 7 or higher. The PSA going up, like I said, is still used. Not everyone can have MRIs. Um, and I've had a few guys over the years that have a PSA that's going up quicker than expected, even with a normal MRI. So we do have to listen to the PSA. But if you compare the people that we treated with a fast rising PSA that needed treatment versus the men that got treated because we repeated the biopsy or they had an MRI that changed. The guys that got treated because we, we waited till the PSA was going up, they didn't do as well. So it really is progression on the repeat biopsy or the MRI that's used. Um, how many times can one safely have their biopsy taken? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think the, 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 the reason why is that there is some data, the more biopsies that you have, the more likelihood that you can develop scarring, and that can lead to erectile dysfunction. Um, what, it's a, there's a big study, a big program down in Baltimore at Hopkins, 
which is probably the other big one in the world compared to ours. And, and there's a couple others too. It's not that they're the only ones, but they have historically done biopsies almost every single year in those men. And what they show in, in a paper several years ago is that the guys that are on surveillance longer are more likely to lose erections. And the thought is that because they have a biopsy every single year. We think it's crazy to do a biopsy every year, mainly because we've been doing it every three years and we've shown that the chance of dying is less than 1% with least in six disease, right? So I think the issue with biopsies, there's that risk. The main risk of biopsies though is independent of the number of times you have it. The risk of a biopsy is there's a small chance that you harbor antibiotic resistant bacteria in your rectum that is resistant to the drug that we give you and you develop a severe infection after the biopsy. That's been shown by studies uh, with a Dr. Nam, one of our urologists here, uh, over the years has increased. And first people are saying, oh, because now we're doing 12 needles, not six. And no, it's because antibiotic resistance is increasing in the community because we've been giving people antibiotics for coughs for too long, right? You don't, you know, you, you used to go to the family doctor, you got a cough, ah, they put you on some penicillin. Right, and the problem is that the cough was from a virus; it wasn't from a bacteria. The antibiotics were useless, and it breeded antibiotic resistance to penicillin. And then they had to go to ampicillin. Then they had to go to all. So we're getting to a point where they got these superbugs growing in us that are resistant to the ciprofloxacin that we normally use with a biopsy. The answer to that, though, is we shouldn't be doing the biopsies through the rectum. The biopsy should be done through the perineum, that area between the scrotum and the anus, the taint. Taint your scrotum, taint your anus. That's where the prostate is. In radiation oncology, we have lots of experience with that because that's where our brachytherapy needles go. And in fact, we, that's how we do our biopsies here at Sunnybrook in, in the radiation oncology department. We've taught a couple other urological centers in the city here to do it that way because the infection risk is zero. It, it's a little more uncomfortable because it goes through skin, but it's much safer because there's no risk of infection. So, um, you know, to answer the question, there's no real answer to it. There's always a small risk we do a biopsy. The reason why we, we have historically laid off biopsies once guys hit 75 or above is because the risk of getting a serious infection bad enough, you need to be hospitalized after biopsy is about three to 4%, depending on who you believe. Unless you're really worried about the guy's prostate, you know, putting an 80 year old in the ICU because you want to do a biopsy when the PSA is under control doesn't seem a good trade off. Because if you're missing some just into intermediate disease, they probably won't die because you missed it. Whereas if you have a 50 year old, that guy might. So it's worth the risk. And if he gets an infection, he's probably not going to the ICU. So that's where the, 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 the risk of, of biopsies becomes more relevant. Okay. Thank you. Um, how many are in the program? Uh, yeah, so we have, we have 1,409, at least last I looked, that have enrolled in the program. So they've consented, we can use their data. We have about 600 men that we have their blood, we have their urine. We only actively follow up 600, and that's because we've had about 400 or so get lost to follow up. Uh, we try to track those people down. The issue with research is, is that um, if, if you're my patient and, and you enroll in my study, but you're my patient, so I'm following you, and you don't show up for a year, two years. I can look in to see where the hell you are. I can look in where you've done, where's your PSA, who have you seen? But I'm not allowed to use that for research. I'm not allowed to enter that into a database. The only way we can enter data into our database is if that gentleman has his stuff done at Sunnybrook. So there are a bunch of guys that we have lost to follow up that I know are alive and well, but we're not allowed to enter it because we have to censor that data. So we have about 600 we actively see. I myself probably um, add, at least pre-COVID, into our program um, about 10 a month. Dr. Klotz, who would be the other big one that would get referral, might do roughly the same, maybe a little less than that. Um, so that, it, it does slowly grow up over time. Um, we've had a bit of an influx in people coming in the last year because one of the outside centers realized that they're uh, radiologists and their MRI weren't up to snuff. So they figured get them into the door here, see me once a year, do all the imaging here and see their urologist closer to home. And that's the model we've done. Um, so 1400 and counting. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I think that that's something that, it, that's why I think that what, when Sunnybrook publishes on active surveillance, it's listened to in the world because it's the biggest and the oldest. Um, so we have a lot to, to show. Okay, next one. Um, what percent never need treatment? So, am I, am I, is my screen still up? Yep. This is older data. I, I think it'll be a little bit different. So if you look at our guys that have been on surveillance, almost half of the men that are still being followed at 15 years still haven't been treated. It doesn't mean that they won't be. So I, we had a guy um, in the last six months or so who's 90 and, and his disease changed. And ultimately we decided that to get treated because he was, he was a 90 year old that was gonna live to 100. So we don't stop surveillance. Um, unfortunately, when I first started here, about two years into surveillance, we had one of our guys that had been on there from the very beginning, diagnosed in 1994, went on surveillance. Um, he was 94 years old and his PSA was always high because he had a big prostate, it was around 20. And then I saw him, one of the first times I saw him because I had just taken over the program, and it went up, his PSA went to 100. And I said, oh, this isn't real. You probably, it's probably inflammation. And then, and then we repeated it in a month and it was 120. And ultimately, uh, he died of prostate cancer. He's one of our deaths. Uh, he died at 96. Uh, and did really well up to the end, was still driving himself down to Florida to golf. A remarkable guy. And, you know, he, he kind of, he was a bit philosophical about it. He's like, you know, people always told me I wouldn't die of prostate cancer. But I showed them. I uh, lived long enough for it. So I think that, you know, I think that I would, I would imagine that this curve, as you see here, is higher now because a lot of these guys that got treated, got treated, probably they didn't need it. Um, but with hopefully with our new update, we'll have it better. But I, I, I usually tell guys that I do expect, expect about a 25% chance of being treated within five years. And then not that much of a chance afterwards. So it may kind of go up to 30% long term, but I don't think it's the 50% that we were seeing historically. If you look at the other big um, surveillance, surveillance protocols in the world, they treat way more guys than we do. So more than 50% of the men are treated usually within five to 10 years because any little change they treat. And that's not that we're right and they're wrong, it's just a different program. Makes sense. Um... Another one here. I have the impression that general practitioners are a significant key to getting patients to have a PSA test, yet the last info I saw from OHIP was not helpful in this regard. Does that thought make sense? And if so, are there any suggestions for improving on this? Yes, um, you're, you're right. I mean, unfortunately, and I think I, I don't know if it's worth doing, I had some slides because I used to put that into my talk. So you know, the, prob the problem is, and if you, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, so your problem is, is that there were two large studies that were done with PSA testing. One was a big European study. What they randomized 160,000 men to either having PSA testing or not. And what they showed is that there was a difference. You did, you did save lives if you did PSA testing. That said, 570 men needed to be screened for 13 years to prevent one prostate cancer. And 18 men needed to be diagnosed and ultimately treated to save one life. I, I think that, that those numbers are okay. If this was breast cancer, this would be the biggest story in the world. I treat breast cancer as well, right? So I can say that. The problem is, is that then the, the Americans did a, a, a study roughly around the same time, 77,000 men, they were randomized again to screening versus not, and they showed no difference. There was more cancer in the screen, screen population, which is expected, but there was no difference in life or death. The problem is that that study was very flawed. It was incredibly contaminated. So of the men that went into the no screening arm, a high proportion of them went off and got screened. And I always joke at that it's because you can't tell an American what to do. They were said, okay, you can't be screened. And they all went, okay. And they went to their family doctor and had a PSA test. As well as a majority of those men had been screened before going into the study. So you, you weeded out the people that end up having cancer. You're getting a whole group that aren't going to have cancer or less likely to have cancer. So it's a very flawed study. So what happened was 
a, the U.S. task force in the U.S. about 10 years ago advised against PSA testing. And that was the recommendation that went out to general practitioners. In the Canadian uh, cohort here that didn't involve anybody that had, was a prostate cancer uh, clinician, just went with what the U.S. said which was a big loss because what they should have done is said, PSA test, but go on surveillance. So the issue is not PSA testing. The issue is over treating. That's the problem. It's doctors behaving badly, treating people that don't need to be treated. Now what happened was a couple of years ago, data started coming up and then all of a sudden, oh, we're now we're seeing all these higher grade prostate cancers because people aren't doing PSA testing or DREs. And now they've softened it. Now that now the, the task force came out and said, well, maybe you should discuss it with the patient and it should be considered. The problem is, is that those type of big messages that get percolated down to the family doctor level take a long time to change practice. And I don't blame anybody for this other than maybe the politics uh, that was going on is that they were told that PSA testing causes harm. And there's no doubt they have, they have people in their practices where harm was caused. They see people that had surgery or radiation that didn't need it, and, and they feel guilty because they did the PSA test that led them into that mess. So I think that the, the messaging we're trying to do with talks like this is, I, I, I give other talks in regards to awareness. I give talks to family practice. Uh, you know, I gave a talk here to our Sunnybrook group. It was several years ago, mind you, before this updated screening thing came out. And even one of our own docs said, you know, why are you telling us to do PSA testing? Like, and I'm, this is in Sunnybrook, the place where active surveillance w was born. And I had one family doctor, in fact, um, behind my back, but it got to me, um, joke or criticize me saying that I believed in PSA testing because I wanted people to get prostate cancer so I could put them on surveillance, which is just crazy. Because the truth is that I have to watch someone on surveillance for 10 years before I make as much money if I just treat the damn bugger, right? So this is, there's no money in this for, for this. This is just the right thing to do. So I think that, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I do tell patients that if you, if your family doctor doesn't believe in PSA testing, you should have a frank discussion about it. If any family doctor is dogmatic against it, then you need to get a new family doctor because it's all about personal choice, what your element of risk is, what you're willing to accept. You're willing to accept the chance of being overdiagnosed but if you're, if you're knowledgeable and they're knowledgeable, you know then you can go on surveillance. We definitely recommend it for people with family histories, men of Caribbean or uh, Western African heritage or men with known genetic predispositions. There's no controversy. The PSA test is covered in that, uh, so it's recommended. So that's the kind of message I think they should go back to family doctors. Thank you. Um... What is considered a high PSA? I have heard PSA of 60 and even 363. So, um, yeah, so that's, so it's all depends on the situation. I've seen PSAs of greater than 10,000. Oh. So I think in a man that's being screened, it depends on his prostate size and his age. So the normal cutoff of four really is age. I'm pretty young, much younger than Dr. Cox. Uh, and uh, uh, he may be better looking, but I'm younger. But um, if I had a PSA of four, that would be very abnormal. My PSA should be around one, maybe two, if I have a big prostate. Uh, if I had a man who's 70 years old with a little bit of a big prostate, PSA of four would be completely normal. So that's the difference. Now, a man with a PSA of 60 either has prostate cancer or has an infection that the PSA will go back down. So it's pretty rare once you have a PSA of greater than 20 for that to be normal. And that's where uh, I think that people get lulled into the PSA doesn't mean much. We've seen that. We hear these testimonies. Oh, my PSA was 100 and I did fine. I mean, the truth is that if a man has a PSA of 100, he has prostate cancer, probably metastatic prostate cancer until proven otherwise. I do have guys in my practice that have PSAs around 100 that um, were, were, was just in the prostate because we cured them. So that is possible. But in more cases than not, it isn't the case. So I think I, I would say when it comes to PSA and what your value is and what considered to be normal, don't confer with Facebook, confer with your urologist or your oncologist. If your PSA is 20, it's not normal. If, you're, if you've had a, a, a radical prostatectomy 
and your PSA is 0.2, that's not normal. It seems low, but it should be zero. Uh, so it really depends on your situation. Um, have recent genetic studies changed any of the rules around eligibility for active surveillance? A man with T1C and some pattern four, when is he eligible or not eligible for active surveillance? Right, so the first question is, has genetics changed things? So mm -hmm. kind of, um, and that's an area of controversy as well. Um, before this crazy pandemic, uh, we had our annual meeting in February in San Francisco. We all knew this was coming. I, 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 we, thankfully, it was the last trip I did. But there was a big discussion regarding some of the genetic mutations that we know of, whether or not men that have them. So this is a mutation you're inherited. This is not something in the prostate. This is a mutation in a gene that you carry, your parent, one of your parents carried, it's you know, put, put down. It's in every single one of your cells. There's a study that showed that there's a couple of genes, in particular one called BRCA2, that if you looked at men that had a BRCA2 mutation that went on surveillance, they didn't do as well as you would expect. So a lot of us use that gene in particular. If we knew a man had that mutation, we would not put them on surveillance. That's a bit controversial because the data is still too young. I run a program where we follow men with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And I have a study open where we do, regardless of what their PSA is, we do an MRI-guided biopsy. Because I think that men with these mutations should have MRIs. And we have had several men with BRCA2 mutations get found to have low-grade prostate cancer that I don't recommend surveillance, despite the fact that I'm very comfortable following prostate cancers. I mean, there's very few people in the world that have seen as many as I, uh, and I also very comfortable with these genes. Now, BRCA1 is one of the other genes we talk about. It. The jury's out. I just, I just had a conversation with a guy uh, on Friday who has a BRCA1 mutation. We found this low-grade prostate cancer on this study, and he's probably going to go on surveillance. And I think that's okay, because some of the genes may mean that he's more likely need to be treated, but I think it's okay to watch. That's the other big study that I, I'm doing, not including these BRCA1 and BRCA2. Those are the breast cancer genes, if you might recognize them. Um, but I think that genetics will, and I do suspect in the future, what we will have is a panel of genes that any man that's contemplating going surveillance has done. So we can identify the few guys, it'll be less than 10%, that maybe shouldn't be watched. In regards to Gleason 7, I don't have a, an answer for that. Um, I mean, I think that most of us think that if you, if, if you have the biopsy and less than 10% of the cancer is pattern four, surveillance is not crazy. Um, I, I don't think it's safe in a 50 year old with that because you're just risking having more aggressive disease that's harder to cure. But in our data, acknowledging all the caveats I talked about, we couldn't find a safe level of, P, uh, of Gleason 4. We compared the guys with less than 10% to more than 10%, 20%. We tried all the different combinations. Now, we may not have found it because we didn't have enough people in there to show it. And that's always a problem with these types of studies. But I, I can't tell guys. My, my, my gut feeling is that if a guy with, with a low amount of pattern four that has, um, uh, is willing to accept uncertain risk and can have an MRI, it's okay to consider. Uh, I don't outright recommend it because there still may be a difference in life or death at the 10 year time frame. Makes sense. Um, what is the rate of upstaging men on active surveillance from group one to group two? And what is treatment recommendation versus staying on active surveillance? Yeah, so that's roughly the same as that graph we just had up in regards to people that needed to be treated. Um, acknowledging that 40% of those men were, were treated because their PSA was going up too quickly but those guys all must have had higher grade cancer. That's why their PSA was going up quickly. I just think it was too late. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the majority of the men that we treat. So a quarter by five years are because of grade progression. So going from grade group one to grade group two, it's not that common to go to grade group three or grade group four, thankfully. It's not possible, but it's, it's not common. And then those guys, all the treatments are, are the same as they were when they were Gleason six. Surgery, radiation, brachytherapy, um, different types of radiation. So then that's kind of the allure of surveillance is as long as people are watched, the treatment options don't change. It used to be a problem when I started here, uh, you know, 12 years ago, we couldn't do brachytherapy for Gleason 7 prostate cancer. The government wouldn't let us. 
And it's because men that have Gleason 7 are less likely to be cured of their prostate cancer with brachytherapy than cured with Gleason 6. The flaw to that logic is that no matter what you choose, guys with Gleason 7 are less likely to be cured. They're less likely to cure with surgery. Less, so it didn't make any damn sense. So eventually, they, uh, not we, whoever did you know, the brachytherapy gods petitioned the government and they agreed that, oh, that doesn't make, you're right, it doesn't make much sense. It's a cheaper treatment. It has less side effects than the other things. So now we can give brachytherapy for any prostate cancer. So I think all the options are still there. It all depends on which poison you prefer. And I mean, I have become a relatively... Um, popular radiation oncologist uh, in Toronto because I don't have much bias. I don't think radiation is better than surgery. I think they're all roughly the same. They both have a small chance of making you miserable. You can only decide which of those you're willing to accept. Um, there's a comment here. Dr. Vesperini said pathological pro progression G6 to G7. I thought Dr. Klotz said that did not happen. So yeah, Dr. Klotz has theories and we all have theories. So I think what, what, what Dr. Klotz means is that he doesn't think the Gleason 6 turns into Gleason 7. What he thinks is that the Gleason 6 is a marker that the prostate's making cancers. You, so you might find Gleason 7 in the future. These are theories, we don't know. Um, you know, I think that they're, they're probably one and the same. It doesn't really make a big difference. Uh, I mean, I think that if you logically think of all other cancers, um, diseases change over time um, and the, the only problem with prostate cancer is that it's not like a lung tumor or a breast tumor it doesn't grow and then it becomes something the whole prostate is is changed so for example there are some studies where if you take the prostate and you biopsy the tumor and you biopsy the normal prostate the normal prostate's not normal there's something wrong with that prostate, it's making cancers. Or maybe that's just the way the prostate should be. I have a study where what we do is we're biopsying the, the, uh, something called uh, introductal components, a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. We biopsy the actual normal prostate cancer, and then we biopsy the normal prostate gland to see whether we can see an evolution of the genes in them. Is it changing? Are they completely different entities? Or is it an evolution of one disease? That won't answer this question, um, but it, it does tell you that we don't really know uh, how the disease progresses because you, you, you can't always get back to that same spot to see that it's changed. Um, is histologic subtype pattern in a Gleason 4 helpful or harmful when considering active surveillance? If you have subpattern 4, uh, uh, well, like I, you know, I think Unless your life expectancy is less than five years, um, we, we do recommend treatment regardless of how much pattern four you have. And with all those caveats that I have no problem with a guy going on surveillance as long as he, he doesn't have a high percentage of pattern four. And he's willing to accept that we may, be, we may be wishing we did something five years from now. So on paper, any pattern four shouldn't be watched. Okay. That's very controversial, and that's why there's all these debates, and that's why it's such a huge area of research with, with, with that, with that around the world is being done. Um, okay. You mentioned 75 to 80 years old for follow-up. Can you comment on why not specific, um, either 75 or 80? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what I mean. I think, I think what, uh, what, oh, uh, in regards to whether we keep doing biopsies, it depends on people's protoplasm. Uh, it depends on people's um, philosophy. So for example, if I see a guy that's 77, um, who PSA is under control, everything is fine, we talk about the biopsy. He may want to have it. He may say, look, I got no medical problems, I'm 75, I may will live to 90. And then we would talk about the biopsy. Or, or, or some guys would say, you know what? I'm not gonna let you treat me unless it's really bad. Then why are we doing biopsies if we don't think anything is wrong there? The nice thing is that um, that was more of a conversation back before we had MRIs. It's very easy now. I see a guy that's 84. If he's still good and his life expectancy is long and he's willing to have an MRI, we just do the MRI. If the MRI shows something really bad, we do a biopsy. If it doesn't, then we know we're not missing. In our experience, if you have a, a, a normal MRI, the likelihood you're missing a cancer that we may want to treat is about 5%. So that's the Gleason 7s, grade group 2. The chance we're missing a grade group three, four, five is, is 
not zero, but it's not, it's less than 1%. So a guy that's 80 that has an MRI with nothing there, we're all very comfortable not biopsying him. A guy that's 60, yeah, maybe should consider it. So that's why the age group is, 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 is in there because that, that worry that we're gonna cause more harm in the 80 year olds than the 60 year olds doing biopsies. We still follow though. So it's not that you discharge people, right? I got a guy in the program who's 97. He, and I don't, you know, I don't know if he needs to keep coming in, but he likes coming in. He's pretty inspirational to me, so I let him come. Yeah. He wasn't very happy because I called him a couple weeks ago and he didn't get to come in because of the oh. pandemic. <laughs> I think coming in is one of his social things to talk to me. Oh. <laughs> um, are transperennial biopsies now standard at Sunnybrook? And will that change compliance with BX? Uh, so it is not standard. Uh, it is available. We on, it only gets done in the radiation oncology department. Uh, our urologists don't do it, and our interventional radiologists don't do it. So the majority of men that are on surveillance that have MRI biopsies have a transrectal biopsy because our radiologists do it. They don't know how to do the transperineal. The issue with transperineal biopsies is uh, skill, obviously. And like anything else, you need to know how to do it. It also takes a little bit longer. It requires some freezing. So I think that there's always been a bit of reluctance in the urological world to take it on because it's just a volume thing. I mean, I mean, everyone here as urologists know that, you know, they got a lot of people to see and you add five or 10 minutes per procedure and you, your wait list goes through the roof. So we offer it now to men that either ask for it uh, or men that we really are worried about infection or men that have had infection in the past. The only issue is, is that it is, the biopsies are done by our radiation oncologists that do brachytherapy, not by the MRI radi radiologists, who quite frankly are better. So if you, if you got a one centimeter spot on MRI, you want the guy that's gonna get the bullseye, and that's the radiologist, because that's what, that's what they do. Uh, so I think that until, until there's a more of a, a, a tsunami or a paradigm shift, uh, it'll always still be that the, the transrectal biopsies are, are, are the standard option with transperineal being on the table for men that want it. Great. Um, what, okay. What you are saying can change the focus of support groups from supporting men post-treatment to supporting men on AS. What do you recommend our support groups do to support men on AS? Um, I mean, I think, well, part of it is, is this kind of engagement, right? I mean, I think, uh, you know, AS is, is a, a bit of a niche thing, you know, everybody treats, uh, you know, active surveillance programs, you know, not that urologists and oncologists out in the community can't do surveillance, they can, they just don't have the expertise and the handle of all the data and the knowledge. So I think that this is one of it, and mainly because I think it's a, it's a matter of comfort, it's a matter of awareness of knowing what's available, what's not available, what's changing. And again, that's probably one of the reasons why surveillance, uh, men with low risk disease in the community don't do as well as men in academic centers. Not because anyone's volitionally doing a bad job. It's just, it's hard to keep up with what's going on. If you are a single practitioner in a very busy community without the access to the university and the professors and the, I mean, it's just one of those things. So I think that uh, this type of awareness is important. Um, you know, I think that also advocating, um, you know, patients advocating is important. Uh, ex explaining your experience. You know, the truth is, is that, and this is not a, this is not a negative thing about support groups, is that support groups tend to accumulate people that um, are having struggles with their disease, have significant side effects from their disease, and that's why they need help. And it's, it's a good source of help. Less and less people go to support groups that have no issues, no side effects of therapy, and they breeze through it. So when I liken it to, and you know, anyone that's kind of heard my talks before, this is the same analogy, and it, it's true, is that if you walk into a McDonald's and ask people, do they like McDonald's? Most are gonna say yes, that's why they're there. You ask most of us on the street, that stuff's horrid. Like, I don't like McDonald's. I kind of like, I kind of like quarter pounders, but it's, it's one of those things where you get a very by, if you go into a support group and you ask about side effects of therapy, you're going to get a skewed answer because the people that are there are more likely to have had problems. 
Not that that's a bad thing. So I think the issue is that there needs to be more advocacy in people that are there to support others, either being on surveillance to support others or having had treatment to support others, to, to understand their navigation, their experience, and it, not just those that have um, a concerns. Because I think that that's the small concern we have with, with support groups, um, especially with surveillance, right? I mean, I think that um, it's, it's, I think that people when they're first embarking upon their journey and they're trying to find answers, they go to support groups, that's excellent. Um, it's just not as much surveillance kind of that sits around. So people on surveillance, hopefully get in, keep involved with these support groups and support it to help, you know, the, the guys that come in that, you know, kind of like deer in the headlights don't know what to do. Um. I had my PSA double from 3 to 5.8 in 15 months before my first biopsy indicated Gleason 6. Does the biopsy negate the concern over doubling time? So yes and no. Um, you know, you, you, a PSA from 3 to 5 on any individual um, um, measurement means nothing. I mean, you can blow a fart, your PSA goes up. I mean, it's not like it's not indicative of cancer. Uh, in fact, we have many guys in our program if you look at their diagnosis PSA, it's eight. Uh, and their PSA has never been above one since. And that's because they got a bit of a big prostate. Their PSA flared up to eight. People panic. They do a biopsy. They find one core of Gleason 6 disease. Their PSA goes back down to one or two, how it would have been. So that man was picked up by accident. His PSA went up to eight, nothing to do with cancer. It was because he he sat on a biker and his prostate was inflamed or he got busy the, with the misses the night before. So we don't use any individual PSAs as indicators. That's why we do it every three months for the first two years. But in general, to answer the question uh, less verbose, is, is yes, the biopsy trumps the PSA. Unless the PSA keeps going up and you can't explain it. Uh, and that's also why MRIs are so important. Because just like that picture I showed of you of a guy, an MRI will sometimes see a disease that was missed on the biopsy and explains the PSA being higher than it should. So for this individual guy, you know, we would say go on surveillance, keep checking the PSA. If the PSA keeps this trend, it goes from five to seven to eight to nine. Then it'd be like, okay, there's something more going on here. And I wouldn't say treatment, but definitely an MRI if possible. And if not, a repeat biopsy. Thank you. Um, can active surveillance apply to monitor possible recurrence after surgery? In other words, how to lessen anxiety regarding possible METs down the road? That's, I mean, I, I hope that's what the urologist is doing. I mean, it's, you know, the, the difference is being that you don't need biopsies. You know, I'll, I mean, I'm, I'm a treating oncologist, so I treat men with radiation. Um, we follow all of our men with PSAs every six months for the first couple of years, every year, and we listen to you. So if I have a guy two years after radiation, his PSA is 0.5, but he calls me and tells me he has a, a, a pain in his lower back. And you know, I tell him, you know, it's because you're getting old, but let's do an x-ray. Um, so, so it's not active in that, you know, we wouldn't recommend biopsies in people after surgery, radiation. We recommend PSA tests. The PSA, PSA test gets a really bad name, I think, unfortunately, based on those earlier studies I told you about and some of the recommendations. But the truth is that after someone's been treated, the PSA is an incredibly powerful test. Other cancers would love to have it. It will herald disease progression years before there's any issue. Unlike other things, so for example, one of the other cancers that my genetics guys unfortunately get are pancreatic cancer. Uh, and pancreatic cancer does have a tumor marker called CA199. It's a, it's, it tells us how people are doing. The problem is by the time CA199 is going up, it's too late. So it's, it's okay to see how people are monitoring and how they're doing the treatment, but it doesn't actually give us a huge time to figure out what's going on. So that's all people need after treatment is a PSA. And if a PSA is going up after surgery, men need to be considered for radiation. And there's lots of studies now that show that it's safe to watch men after an operation and only intervene when the PSA starts to go up. Um, can you speak to the importance of free PSA and PSA density in deciding on active surveillance? Yeah, we haven't found, um, so we haven't found a lot of correlation between those. So the free to total ratio 
is the, is the, the, the amount of free PSA floating around in the blood to the amount that's bound to protein. And as that number goes down, the more the likelihood is someone has prostate cancer. It does nothing about prognosis, so it's never been of value. The PSA density is the amount of PSA someone has uh, based on prostate volume and all these other parameters. We've looked at that in our database and we've never really seen a correlation. Um, it has been shown in other cohorts that the higher the PSA density, the, the, the more the chance that someone would need to be treated the issue is that it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do worse. Um, we, do f we do look at it every once in a while because I think that uh, we might be missing something. It might just be that our cohort doesn't have it. The issue with our historical cohort is that they didn't, um, they didn't measure how big the prostate size was. So it may be that in our data, we're not seeing it because they, the first 400 guys, we don't even know how big the prostate was. So I, I think that, um, you know, in our experience, it didn't seem to make a difference. I, we, we don't really look at it here, other than the fact that if I see a guy with a PSA of, let's say, eight, who has a very small prostate, in the back of my mind, I think, eh, we might be missing something. So that's PSA density. I'm doing it in my head, uh, right? So on individual patients, it may make a difference, but we haven't seen it being a difference in our larger cohort. Okay, makes sense. Um, this one, replaced hips yields no MRI. Yeah, that is a problem. Um, you know, I try to sneak in guys with one hip, and even then the radiologists say, this, 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 Dr. Vesperini. They still read it for me. But yeah, that is the problem. And I have several guys, and one guy that, I, that actually uh, is going to start his radiation very soon, because he just had all his planning scans done, uh, who has both of his hips replaced. We've never been able to do MRIs in him. Uh, his PSA has been going up. He had a, his biopsy is still just Gleason 6, and, but I can't explain the PSA going up, so he's being treated. And if, if he didn't have those, those hips, we probably would know why. Um, it, 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 the, the bilateral hips can also cause a bit of an issue with treating people with radiation. It was historically. It thankfully isn't anymore. We have a bunch of brilliant physicists who found ways to ignore the hips and still reconstitute the internal anatomy so we can give radiation. So he's having something called uh, saber or stereotactic radiation, which if he'd asked me five years ago, I'd say, there's no way you're doing it with guys with hips because you can't see what's in between the hips. Mm -hmm. um, but it is possible now. Great. Um, what website has good data on all of the variables in graph forms, such as age, therapies, reoccurrence, et cetera? Thank you, doctor. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I think it, it's, it's, uh, you're never, you're probably never going to find that collected under one thing. Um, you know, I, I would say, uh, don't just listen to my data. Uh, there's lots of other places that you can get data and everyone has their own, uh, opinion and, and their own interpretation of the data. You know, for example, I understand this one, will, this will be put online, right? Yeah. It will be on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot like, you know, there's YouTubes, there's several over the years that we've done with YouTube, you will get the individual institutes data in regards to risks, how to get treated. So that's a, a relatively good way acknowledging that even though, you know, we're for physicians and we're scientists, we're all biased based on our own data. So I tell people, like, I'll send people links to the videos that we've made on YouTube. But I tell them, like, also, like, look at the stuff from Princess Margaret Hospital. Look at, like, the, we all have own interpretation before you go and just believe one guy. It's the same thing when someone gets diagnosed. Don't just see the urologist and think that that's the answer. There's multiple options available. You need to kind of do uh, the homework and go see the people that do it. I tell people, never, never, never trust uh, uh, the plumber when he tells you what the electrician's going to do. Because they think they know, but they probably don't know. Um, and I got people coming to me saying, oh, the, the urologist said this about radiation. I'm like, when did the urologist train? 1970? So I think it's one of those things. And the same with me. Like, I understand surgery and I know the data because I'm an oncologist. All I do is cancer. I don't do anything else. I don't do kidney stones. But I said, I, you got to talk to a surgeon because I'm not a surgeon. I can give you the rough estimates in the literature, but they'll tell you what kind of the modern practice is. And the same thing can be said about surveillance is, you know, get other opinions, watch other people's videos, you know, try to stick to um, academics. Uh, not that we don't have biases, but our biases tend to be founded in the data we have. 
Um, when you just hear Tom, Dick, or Henry, or some guy that's trying to sell you Haifu, uh, that's, you got to be a bit worried about it. So just, you know, be a bit careful when you're online. Um, is Haifu treatment preferable over surgery and or bracket therapy? MRI guided HDR. Uh, so HIFU is definitely preferred by the urologist because they get paid a lot of money. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it is a controversial treatment. I don't have issues. I've sent my patients down to discuss it. There's probably a role for HIFU. The problem is, is that if you look at most of the modern data, the chance of having failure of HIFU is between 40 to 60%. Oh, wow. A large study was done uh, out of a big group that does this epidemiology stuff and looked at HIFU and showed that the chance of biochemical failure after HIFU was 56% or 54%, something like that, over 50%. And then of those men, a lot of men afterwards had radiation and about almost 80% of the men that had radiation were, were cured. The point being is that why would you pick the one that is less likely to work first and pay for it? So I think that HIFU has a lot of problems right now because it's, there's far too much of a perverse incentive. I do encourage people, if they're gonna consider HIFU, to try to be involved in some type of research program because I think that we need to find out who it's right for. Focal HIFU obviously is the one that has the most allure because it's the least side effects. The issue is that you're dealing with only one part of the gland. And we all know if you take a man's prostate out, you don't just find the one tumor. You find multiple tumors. So a man that gets HIFU still has to go on surveillance and then has about a 50% chance of needing to have another treatment. If you have whole gland HIFU, then the chance of control of the disease is higher. But if you look at the, the, the literature where the people have the most experience with it, so the Japanese, the Germans, uh, uh, at least one American group, the rate of having a fistula, so a connection between the rectum and the bladder is about one or 2%. That's horrible. I, I don't know who would take that trade over having had surgery radiation. So I think that got to be careful. There's way too much money at stake when it comes to HIFU. I don't think it's wrong. I think people just need to go with their eyes open. The only other unfortunate thing is that if one of the big groups in Toronto that offers HIFU, um, that, that you know, a lot of the big professors are involved with, has very misleading data on their website. So they have a graph where they compare overall survival in one group compared to the PSA control in the radiation and the surgery group, suggesting that HIFU is better, but they're not comparing the same thing. You can't put those on the same graph. So, but that's unfortunate because most, the average person can't look at a graph and say, this doesn't make any sense. And it makes, it makes people believe that HIFU is superior to the, the standard treatment. So, uh, you know, my, my, my PR, my, my uh, public message is just be very wary about HIFU. There's a lot of hype. That said, I do think there's a role for it. I think it's worthy of research because it's a very good non-invasive way to treat areas. The jury's just out whether it actually makes any difference. In regards to comparison, you know, if you look at side effect profiles, a lot of the big hyper groups have not published their data because I, I think that it's not going to show that it's much better in regards to side effects uh, than, than, for example, brachytherapy or serotactic radiation. Um, but it's a very frank conversation. I usually send my guys with HIFU down to um, downtown Toronto where the big surgeons, they do it. And because I think that their mindset is that they don't think that HIFU is better, but if you want to do it, they know how to do it and they do it well. And that's what I want. I want someone that's going to say, look, I think you should have an operation or radiation, but if you want to, if you want to spend money for something, I can do this good. And, and that's, that's kind of what we do here at Sunnybrook when we send our guys away. Um, I still have about four more questions. Are you still okay to keep going? Yeah, I'm good. I got I, my, my hella medicine clinic uh, finished just before this. So. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I am 72 with a triple bypass <clears throat> and I'm on ABT. Can a PSMA PET scan be had if no other treatment has been done? And um, he said it's grade two Gleason th three to four. So, so, I mean, I guess it's hard to tell because I, I mean, I, I, I guess I, if, you, if you have grade group two, um, we usually don't use hormonal therapy. So I suspect there's something else going on. There's lots of evidence now that hormone therapy is not, of no value with grade group two unless the PSA is very high or there's something else on imaging or the prostate's big enough that you got to shrink it before treatment. PSA PET scans, 
um, depending on where you are, can be had. Uh, having been on hormone therapy, though, depends on how long. The problem is that hormone therapy works so well that even if there was something had been there on PSA PET scan, it'd probably not be able to be seen anymore. Uh, we don't use PSA PET scans as much as we should in Ontario, at least. We can access it on clinical trial. We tend to do it in guys that we're really worried may have metastatic disease and we don't want to waste their time with a local therapy or men that have been treated that it didn't work and we're trying to find out why and where. So I think, you know, the issue is it really depends on where you are in this country. If you can have a PSA PET scan, I would argue that if you can't and you have to pay for it, given the fact you've been on hormones, don't waste your money because it's probably going to come back negative, not because there wasn't something there, but the, the, the hormone therapy has made it so small that even a PSA PET scan can't see it. Okay. Makes sense. Um... I did a 1.5T prostate MRI scan, not a 3T with my replaced hip, but that's just a comment. Okay, um, we have found that many of those who continue to participate in our support group meetings include those wanting help with their survivability. So we cover nutrition and exercise. Is there anything else you would recommend from your observation of long-term survivors? So, so yes and no. I mean, I think that the, most of the evidence suggests that men that remain active and men that have a healthy heart diet, live longer. I've always made a joke that I can do a randomized trial in our program, half the men having a healthy heart diet, the other half not, and we'll show that the healthy heart diet men live longer, but it'll do nothing with the prostate cancer. It's gonna be the fact that they're less likely to die of a heart attack. But it does look like that healthy heart diets in men that have disease and other cancers, it does decrease growth. Very hard to prove in any type of program but you have, you're hard pressed to find a doctor not to tell you to do it. So I tell all my guys, try to stay active, ha have a healthy heart diet, do cardiovascular, you know, 20 minutes of, of exercise where, you know, you have some, you know, not shortness of breath, but you feel like you're a little winded. Um, and cause that is good in general. And it looks like it's good. I'm, I'm, I, I don't kind of advise outside of that because there's no great evidence that makes a difference. For example, vitamins and supplements and all that kind of stuff. In fact, there was a big study done by, uh, Dr. Reidelmeyer here at Sunnybrook that looked at all the, the studies that had looked at some type of supplementation and showed that vitamins on a whole cause harm. Uh, I don't think they do. I think that was just because he did a big study. Um, but, but it looks like, you know, vitamins are vitamins, supplements, they're drugs. You can call it a vitamin. It's a drug. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that anyone that takes high doses of anything, it, it, it's crazy that people are reluctant to take something that we've studied and we know, but they're going to take high doses of vitamin C. That nobody knows what the hell it does because it's a vitamin. So I think that, I think I don't advise anything. I do encourage people to be involved in studies and trials. Uh, in a, you know, for example, we hopefully will start a study at some point, let, mostly by Dr. Klotz, who really has an interest in this, where, for example, uh, capsaicin, which is the unit um, of heat, that's what is in chili peppers. It's capsaicin. The higher capsaicin, the hotter the tamale. And what, what we've shown in, in, in Dr. Uh, Vazu here at, our, at, our, at Sunnybrook showed that capsaicin makes cells, prostate cancer cells, uh, hinder their growth if they're in a test tube. So maybe it does something in, in the body as well. So that's something that I think would be uh, interesting. I'm a skeptic. I have a hard time believing that popping a pill of capsaicin is going to go into your body, go over and get into the prostate and cause magic there, but not cause a risk anywhere else. It's just a naive assertion. Um, but I, that's why we, that's why I encourage it to do research. You know, I tell people I, I drink, I, I go buy the $3 vitamin water. My, my preference is XXS, X, I like it. Oh, it's really it good. makes me feel good about myself, but I mean, I don't think it's doing anything other than the placebo. It makes me feel like I'm doing something. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Are you advising us that patients with Gleason 7, 3, 4, um, grade two should be steered away from AS and move straight to treatment, even with low PSA slash steady scores and very large prostates. No, I, I think that it should just be, you should have a very frank discussion about it because the jury's still out of who's safe to watch and who isn't. I'll be honest with you. If I had that, I'd go on surveillance. I would rather not be treated. Um, I still like my erections, right? I mean, there's things that I wouldn't want to sacrifice. So, so that, that's it. I'm also an oncologist. I'm very comfortable with cancer. You don't ask us 
We've seen it all. I'd be willing to accept that 10 years down the road, I'd say, ah, crap, maybe I should have done something then. But I'm hoping that all the research I'm doing in the meantime with all the fancy radiation we're doing, and it'll get to a point where it doesn't make a difference. So I'm not saying we outright recommend it. It's just that it's not a slam dunk surveillance. It's have a discussion, know the data, except there's a small risk that we're missing the opportunity to cure you at an earlier stage with less side effects um, than just saying that you need to be treated. Because I don't think it's, it's not black and white. Um, what about the ultrasound machine Dr. Klotz has been working with? That's a really cool machine. Um, we, we have talked about trying to do a study to compare MR and that ultrasound machine. Um, I, I, I really hope that it ends up being uh, equivalent in, Dr. Klotz thinks it's better, which could be, he, he has more experience than anyone else, uh, at least equivalent to MRI. Because if we could do an ultrasound that was just as good as an MRI, that would completely change everything. The problem is, is that um, it's one machine that we have, we don't have the data, doing a trial like that would be incredibly expensive. To show something that we call non-inferiority, that A is not inferior to B, would take a few thousand men to show it. And that's a few thousand men to have MRIs, to have ultrasounds. I mean, it's, it would be a trial that would cost several million dollars. So I'm not sure, like Dr. Klotz, myself, and Dr. Loblaw, who are three, the main people in this surveillance kind of triumvirate, we, we are talking about trying to do something because, because that machine, I, you know, I haven't seen it myself, but I, I trust Dr. Klotz and he really thinks in it, having all the knowledge is that in fact it is just the same as an MRI. It would be, be a, a change practice around the world. Yeah. Um, with Gleason three plus four, wouldn't percentages <clears throat> enter into an AS decision? So I think less than 10%, most of us are pretty comfortable, even acknowledging our data that we didn't know. Um, I think one, less than 20%, I think it really depends on people's life expectancy, if they have lots of other medical problems. You get above 20%, then, you know, it's, it's, the thing is, though, it's such an artificial thing. You're trying to pretend you know. You know, my, and I, when uh, Dr. Klotz and I got in a bit of an argument, uh, you know, at a con one of our internal conferences uh, several years ago, because, you know, I likened it to, to, to terrorists on a plane. This was like, this was like all around the whole terrorism thing. Thankfully, now he's kind of worried about COVID. But, um, you know, the issue is that, you, you know, no one walks into the, into the plane and says, are there five terrorists or are there 20? Because the plane's going down. So whether you have, if you believe that Gleason 4 can spread, or Gleason 4 has the potential of causing problems. Whether your needle picked up 10% or it picked up 25, doesn't really matter. Where, you know, in the argument that, that Dr. Klotz had, which is completely right, is that if you have 30% Gleason 4, it means it's been there longer. So it's had more chance to spread. It's not that the four can't spread, it's more of a, just a timing issue. Just like if you have 90% four, it doesn't mean it's spread. It just means it's more likely to have spread. So I think it becomes, that's what it comes down to. I think that less than 10%, that's where you start to really chat about like, oh, do we need to treat you or not? And I've had guys that decide to go on surveillance and I've had guys that after the talk, they're like, you know what, I don't wanna take the chance. And again, I don't think it's life or death. I think it's being treated with a higher risk, of, higher chance of success earlier with less side effects than waiting for five years. Completely acknowledging that I could be wrong and this is just why we need to keep doing the research and, and, and we're going to have our main database done in the, in the bigger study. And then we'll have one of our fellows is going to redo the, the guys with Gleason 7 because we have a lot more guys now, another five years of data. So maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe it'll end up being that there is a percentage. Hey, once you're below 5%, it doesn't make a difference. Um, two more questions if you're still good to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, some recommend a second opinion on the first biopsy. Do you re recommend this if I live in a larger center like Vancouver? Um, uh, yes and no. So, so at Sunnybrook, our policy is to review biopsies um, unless they're done by what we call a uropathologist. So we have audited this in the past, independent of the active surveillance program, where we've taken all of them. We used to, we used to redo everybody's biopsy because we don't trust anybody. Uh, and we did find that depending on where that biopsy and pathology was read, you were more likely to change things. 
So I so for example, for men that have their biopsies down at um, Princess Margaret Hospital, or they have their biopsies done at uh, a center where they send their pathology out to something called Uropath, whether it's a urological pathologist, all they do is your uro prostates. We don't, because we never change their diagnosis. Whereas if it comes from a smaller hospital in the GTA, even with world-class urologists, it's about the pathology. So we will repeat it, acknowledging that it doesn't change that often. It probably changes more going from three plus four to three plus three, where we say, hey, wait a minute, our, our pathologists don't think you have any pattern four. That said, I had one guy sent to me several years ago with three plus three, to be on our, our, we had a randomized trial looking at MRI guy biopsies versus normal biopsies. And we reviewed the pathology as standard and his pathology ended up being four plus three. And his urologist was so angry at their pathology department because he would have put that guy in surveillance with a disease that could spread in five years. Um, so I think that a second opinion should be asked for, but I would trust, especially a big academic center, they've done this they know which ones to trust and which ones to not trust, and then just defer to what they think is. For example, if I put in for a path review on a patient from PMH, my pathology department says, no, we won't do it. And I trust them because they, they know what, who to trust. Um, and finally, CT scan versus MRI. For surveillance, um, yeah, so you want to avoid CTs as much as possible unless absolutely needed. A CT scan is, a, is radiation. Uh, MRIs is not. So MRIs are harmless other than the concern that maybe there is uh, some uh, uh, allergies to the dyes, the gadolinium dye. And there's some evidence that the more MRIs you have, it may build up in the brain. I don't know. I think the jury's still out about that. The issue with a CT scan, uh, it shows very good anatomy in regards to some things. It doesn't show good internal organ anatomy. So it doesn't tell you much about the prostate. It's needed for lymph nodes, for bones, for livers, but it doesn't tell you much about the prostate itself. And keep in mind, and this is why, you know, people will come and say, oh, I got, my belly hurts, and if I get a CT, and we're like, no, and like, you don't get a CT. It's like a CT scan of the abdomen and the pelvis is about 600 chest x-rays. And that, so like that doesn't seem like a lot, but I mean, it, uh, it's radiation, it adds up. So we should only be doing CTs if we need MRIs, it's expensive, it's noisy, people don't like them sometimes, but it doesn't have that risk. So hands down, MRI is way better. There are some cancers where we still follow people with CTs. For example, testicular cancers, I follow men with that as well. We do CTs on them, only because the data is not there yet that MRIs are equivalent, but once that data is there, stop the CTs, because those guys are getting CT scans for 10 years, it's crazy. Um, so for prostate cancer, unless there's a specific reason we're looking for something, lymph nodes, liver, uh, there's really no value in a CT. We used to do a bone scan every year in guys whose PSAs were greater than 15, but that ended up not showing anybody because nobody has spots in their bones when they're on surveillance. Makes sense. Um, that's it for questions in the chat. Does anybody else have anything that they... As Len Gross here in Vancouver, I just want to say thank you, thank you for his very, very honest and for his presentation. You just can't be all things to all people. Thank well, you. Thank you. you thank know, I, I, I've been criticized in the past for my honesty, uh, but you know, you take it as it is. <laughs> it's so refreshing to hear that comment. Thank you. Second that. And I, I, I'd like to say thank you. I think on, on behalf of all of us, you've done a great presentation and we'd like to have you back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's lots of things to talk about. Uh, uh, you know, we, I mean, at some point, once we redo this active surveillance uh, cohort and you know, all the data, we will we'll want to present it to people. Um, obviously, it'll be, it'll be published. Um, but yeah, no, I'm happy to. And I really, I think this is, this venue is good. Other than I don't see if you're laughing with my, to my jokes. But I mean, um, you know, I'm Italian. It's okay. We like your energy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Italian. I talk yeah. with my hands. But I, I think it's... Back. It's one of those things where, you know, I think this is a, a you know, and I think um, uh, th this group has really capitalized on that. I think this, this Zoom venue will, able, will be, it's easy. If one thing, if you said, can you fly out to Vancouver to do this? I could, but I mean, you know, like I'm at a stage of, of my life where I don't I want to fly, fly to Vancouver, you know, and I'm not as bad as some of my colleagues. I have a colleague that flies to Japan for 18 hours to give a talk, oh. you know, and that's because that's the way it was. But this is actually a very good way to still be personal. 
um, but do it in my office. Um, so, so I think it's one of those things where I think there's a multitude of things that can be spoken about, not just me. There's other people at Princess Margaret, at Sunnybrook, at all, all across the country that we can tap into. Yes, we know that. And we've been taking advantage of it. So thank you for be, being part of that team. And thank you, Rochelle. We put him on, we'll have to have him on our list. Yeah. So, absolutely. 20, 20, 20, <laughs> I think as I tell the same jokes every time, you'll be like, oh, that, that joke again. <laughs> well, then we can get him down pat and we can share them. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Visprini. Um, enjoyed it. It was very interesting and informative and uh, lots of stuff that uh, I want to grab and, and use when we uh, do our awareness presentations. So, um, and thank you to Rochelle and, uh, and the folks in BC for putting this on. Yeah, Rochelle is really good at this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bisprini. That was wonderful. My pleasure. Do we have any more questions or comments or anything? Okay, well, thank you so much for, uh, you know, ha for, for giving us your time and for, for spending the afternoon with us. <laughs> My pleasure. I, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. We'll Enjoy you your later. week. <laughs> yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.